Are you there? Oh, you are. Look at that. As if by magic. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Let me try it again. See if you're awake. Good morning. Oh, yeah. There you have it. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take a moment. Stand up. Greet somebody near you or far away from you. You just sat down. Well, stay sitting down and just come on over and say hi to those that want to stay seated. No, take a, take a moment to say hi to somebody. All right, I'm going to call you back. By the way, as people are finding their seats, for those of you that are online, I greet you in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of you that are here, I greet you in the strong name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're standing, I'm going to invite you to keep standing because we're going to pray. Look at this. I turn everybody loose and then I can't get them back. Hey, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, we recognize your presence in this place. We know you've preceded us here, Lord. We didn't beat you to the house. You've been here waiting. And as we come into your presence, oh God, we need you. We want you. And it's our hope, Lord, that the things that we say and sing and pray would be pleasing to you like an offering. And we say to you, thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are our rock and redeemer. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. Good morning. I get the privilege today to start a new music program with the kids downstairs for once a month, and I'm so excited, a little nervous, but um, they're going to hear this twice. They're waving at me. Hi. <laughs> um, the scripture, Psalm says that God inhabits the praise of his people, right? That's what we're getting ready to do this morning. And Psalms 95 says, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. That is one way of worshiping, not the only way, but that's what we're going to do here this morning, and we just thank you all for joining us. Sing with us as we sing, All of You is More Than Enough.
taking time to praise God today. Lord God, you are amazing. We did, those of us that are able to stand today are standing in your presence. Your marvelous works on our hearts. Those who are not able to stand, their hearts are raised to you, Lord. And they are worshiping you. Maybe they're driving right now. Maybe they're dealing with situations if they're at work or in their home where they're watching this. But Lord, we are grateful for what you have done for us. And we are just awestruck by your might and your power. You are God. You are greater than any other God. And we are so thankful that you wiped away our sins. honor you today, Lord. Let's focus on the Lord today as we sing this song to him.
may be seated. Children, you are released. There you go. Ushers, would you come forward and uh, serve us? We're going to take some moments to begin a new week of worship in our singing, in our giving, but let this be the beginning of a week of giving to the Lord from your calendar, your relationships, and your talents. Lord, as we take a moment to uh, give in this offering, we're too big to fit in these bags, Lord, but uh, we, we do. We come surrendered to you all that we have because we know that what we have has come from you and that we belong to you. So Lord, we just offer ourselves and it's our hope that you'll receive it as worship. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you've provided. I pray that you'd bless my friends as they worship you. Amen. The Lord bless you as you worship. this mic live please and uh, Stacy and Larry would you come up here please you all uh, I think know Stacy and Larry Eiler and um, as much as I tried to shame them into not moving to Michigan it's not worked uh, they're continuing to listen to the Lord's voice that's a good thing that's a good thing but I wanted to um, here I'm gonna go around you on the other side so uh, I wanted to give Larry and Stacy an opportunity to uh, speak to their church family. And then uh, when they're done, I'm going to ask if you would like to come forward. We're going to just have a moment of uh, laying hands on them and praying for them. So I told you you only have a half hour, so use it however we works best for you. I know that's a dangerous statement. Lord bless you. Well, good morning, everybody. As most of you know, that Stacy and I are going to be leaving next week on Saturday morning. But what many of you may not realize is that both Stacy and I received our salvation in this church. And this is where we got our guidance and the love from all the people that attend here. And we wanted to take a little time this morning just to thank you for your support and for your guidance and your teachings that allowed us to become closer with the Lord. And we really appreciate that, and we just wanted to say that before we left. As you, most of you know, who do know me, I can't not be up here without my <laughs> coffee cup, right? <laughs> and Larry said, you can leave your coffee cup. So no, this is the last time everybody who does know me is going to see me with my coffee cup. So um, d those of you who don't know us, um, and you're new to our church, um, we have been a part of this church for almost 20 years, and it has been well worth it. And like Larry said, everybody is extremely supportive, and they are all about Christ, and they are all about the Bible and the teachings of the Bible. And you form friendships, relationships, sisterhood, brotherhood. You form all that. So when God does call you away, you still have that in your heart so those of you who are new continue to come back and learn from this church and learn from everybody that's here it's going to be extremely hard but God started this journey for us six years ago and unbeknownst to us where we had other plans right we always have other plans right other than what God has and so in our hearts, we were going to retire where we're going. Five more years down the road, 10 more years, whatever it was. And God is like, no, I know your heart and I have something for you. And your family back home 
need you right now. And so he is calling us. And it has been a journey already. It's been extremely stressful. And I'm trying to relate it to Abraham's story. When God called Abraham, and he didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't give him plans ahead of time. And so right now, that is what we have had to just settle with. We know what we want to do. We have plans for us when we get there, but they're still not confirmed. So we are just trying to look at it as the way that Abraham did. And he, God called, and he went. And that's what we're doing. And so I just wanted to, um, I was actually supposed to preach today. <laughs> and I told Pastor Sean, I said, I just, I just can't. There's just too much going on. But I just want to say that God is there. God is with you. If you ever, ever feel like you are alone, you are not. You are not. Reach out to him. Just lean into him. Because God has not answered us every single day during this. He has not said, okay, do this, Stacy, do this, Larry. Not at all. It's been quiet. And it's been quiet because not that he's left, he's still there, but because he wants us to lean into him and ask for his guidance and say, Lord, we need you, help us. What do we do right now? That's what he wants. So if you ever, ever feel like God is not listening and God's not there, that is not true because he is. He is. Amen. And that's kind of the gist of what I was going to preach about. But <laughs> so we just, yeah, we just want to shower our love and give our love and our blessings to all of you. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you're on a roll. You might as well finish the <laughs> sermon. Um, before we pray, I just, I was studying the scriptures about um, a couple named uh, Priscilla and Aquila. They were uh, partners, ministry partners with the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's unclear how they came to faith in Christ, how they came to a place where they decided they were going to surrender their lives to Jesus. But it's clear that they became rooted, deeply rooted in their faith, and they grew spiritually mature, so much so that they were uh, pastors to a church out of their house, Paul mentions them several times, Priscilla and Aquila. And that's what I think about when I think about uh, Stacy and Larry is that they came to faith in Christ through the, the ministry of the Lord in this place and through the people. And it's always the ministry of the Lord, isn't it? So we don't have to worry about taking credit for it because he gets all of the credit. But he uses anyone who's willing as a vessel, right? And so this is the, this is the place where Stacy and Larry gave their lives in a surrender of their faith to Christ. And then they began to grow in, in obedience to him and helped others to follow. And so we bless you for that. Thank you so much. And, uh, and we want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you to just uh, step down there. And I'm going to, we're going to take a moment to move around if you'd like. We, I invite you to come forward. And we will um, pray. Take a couple more steps down so people can get down to you. There you go. Okay. I can imagine this has been going on for thousands of years where uh, church fellowships gather around one another to pray for all sorts of reasons, for commissioning, for healing, for blessing. So we're just following in the lines a uh, long, long tradition of the church over thousands of years. Lord, we submit our will to yours. As I pray, I, you know, I, I have not wanted my brother and sister to go. And yet, it's your church. They belong to you. And we want your will to be done here on earth, just like it is in heaven. Instead of our will, Lord, 
Yours is always best. I thank you that you helped Larry and Stacy understand who you were and that you used them to help others know who you were, Lord Jesus. Would you give them the strength they need for packing and traveling and unpacking and building all sorts of building, building of relationships and homes and ministries? Would you use them as vessels there in Michigan, helping others to become rooted in you? All for your glory, Lord Jesus, all for your glory. Larry and Stacy, we just say the Lord bless you and use you. He's trustworthy. He's worth it. He will be your provider. Amen. 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 Yeah. Thanks, friends. Oh, don't forget your cup of anger management, Stacy. Yeah, you're going to want that. Thank you. Jesus and caffeine or whatever. Um. <laughs> The old phrase, just say no, comes to mind, Stacy, but I don't think that's going to help. One other thought um, as we, uh, just before we transition to time in the Word. Um, so there is no replacing Stacy. She's one of a kind. The Lord broke the mold and then made her. Or, no, I think I said that wrong. The Lord made her and then broke the mold. That's it. That's. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm half kidding. Um, so, uh, you know, we've wondered how, how do we proceed with the, it, the administrative ministry that Stacy has overseen? And we have uh, hired Debbie Bauer to uh, begin to fill in the role that Stacy has uh, so faithfully fu fulfilled. And Debbie will be with us for an undefined time. It's not going to be years and years, but um, I should say uh, by way of full disclosure, Debbie is my sister, Diane's oldest sister. Debbie has gifts of administration and organization extraordinaire. So if you're worried that who's going to boss Sean around now that Stacy's gone, uh, Debbie will do just fine. Um, but she, she really wants to get to know you and serve you as the church. Debbie and Ben are part of another fellowship here in Eugene, but you'll see them periodically around this place as well. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask me, but uh, we'll also hopefully get an opportunity along the way to be introducing you to Debbie in a variety of ways. So, are you ready for a little bit of the Word? Okay. Let's pray, and then we'll get into it. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us in a way that we can understand. And I, I do, Lord. I, that's my prayer for my friends and myself, for us here in your presence, that you would help us to understand what we'll hear and read in the Word. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us and be our teacher today and give us courage to follow you? If you would do that, we'll be okay. Jesus, all for Jesus. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you as the one true God. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So uh, I'm going to read a couple of different place, uh, places in the Scripture. The first is going to be in the Old Testament, and then, then I'm going to read some of the words of Jesus. But I want to tell you a story that happened to me as a young pastor. Well, I never really was a young pastor. I was an old rookie. I just started pastoring late. And uh, there was a young man. There were, there were actually quite a few college students and high school students and young ones in the church and there was a young man named Sean and I liked him for I mean obvious reasons because I liked his name and uh, Sean was very earnest follower of the Lord Jesus as a young man and he came to me and he said I have a friend named Levi and Levi and I have made an agreement but 
you need to be part of it too. And I said, well, what did you buy for me? And he said, well, Levi, his family goes to the Mormon church and we talk a lot about God and Jesus. And we don't always agree. And I thought, well, okay. And I said, what was the agreement that you made with Levi? And he said, well, I, I agreed that I would meet with the Mormon missionaries at his church and let them talk to me about what they believe in the Mormon church if he would meet with you. And so will you. And I said, well, it sounds like I've, I'm already in on that. So, yep, I'll do that. I'll do that. I said, do you feel okay about that? I mean, are you nervous? He goes, no, no. Levi and I have a great relationship. No, not at all. I'm not nervous at all. And so he said, okay. Uh, he goes, I'm going to, I'm in this, the first week I'm meeting with the Mormon missionaries and then he's going to follow afterwards here. And I said, are you going to be in on that conversation? You know, nope. It's just you and Levi. I'm like, well, how does Levi feel about that? Well, he said, I guess we'll find out, won't we? So anyway, the night before I was going to meet with Levi, I felt like God spoke to me. And it wasn't audible. But at that point, I'd been following the Lord <clears throat> more than 30 years. Well, not quite 30 years. But I'd been in the process of learning how to understand when the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And sometimes it's clear that fast. And other times I have to work on that and go back and, Lord, is this you? Are, are you saying this? I always like it when it's real quick, especially if I like it. Because sometimes the Lord says things that are hard. Have you ever encountered that? But I, I like it when I don't have to work at understanding. And this was one of those times when right away as I was thinking and praying about this meeting that I was going to have with Levi, I felt like the Lord said this to me, do not argue with Levi. I thought, I wasn't looking to pick a fight. I mean, I'm, I'm not... I'm not what would I argue? I'm not going to argue with him. And then I heard the Holy Spirit again. Don't argue with that young man. And I'm like, Lord, you, you're obviously seeing something that I don't see. And I just commit to you, I'm not going to argue with him. Okay. So then Levi comes the next day. And... We're talking, and I said, well, hey, listen, I'm, it's, it's your nickel, buddy, so what, what do you want to talk about? And he said, well, I, I want to talk about God. And I'm like, let's do it. So we start talking about God, but I noticed very quickly as we're going along that Levi is getting agitated. You know how, like in your marriages, you know that tone matters, Right? You could say, what? Or you could say, what? Right? Tone matters. Same word. And you can tell by countenance. The people communicate with their, you know, their countenance and, and body language. And I can tell Levi's getting honked off. You know that word honk? Like he's getting torqued off. Ticked off. And I'm like, and I hear, I, I don't hear the Lord. I just remember what he said to me the night. Don't argue with him. I'm like, I feel like I've been set up. Like, what's going on? And so I, I'm trying to just figure out what's happening. And I said, Levi, could I just share with you an observation that I'm having? I, I think I am observing that you're agitated or angry. And is that correct? He goes, yes. I'm like, okay, check. All right. And I said, Is you, are you agitated or angry with me? He goes, yes. Let me check. All right. I'm right in there. I'm picking up the right cues. And I said, w why? What, what? I, don't, I don't want to do that. Why? 
And he said, well, I don't like it that you think I'm not going to heaven. And I'm like, whoa, you made a quantum leap somewhere that, like, I skipped off the atmosphere. Because when did I say that? Did I say I think that you're not going to heaven? He goes, no, but that's what I think you think. <laughs> well, I think a lot of things about a lot of things. And I said, and so now my mind is just reeling because I'm still hearing the Lord say, do not argue with that young man. And I'm like, Lord, I'm trying here. I don't want to argue with Levi. And so... You know, it's uh, that, that arrow prayer where you don't know what to do and you just quietly, I need help. Boo! You know? And I'm like, Lord, I need help. I don't and then I had a thought. And I thought, okay, so he's really thinking about heaven. And I said, well, let, could we talk about heaven? And he goes, you know, and, and he still honked off. Yeah. I'm like, could we talk about it without you punching me, maybe? So we started talking about heaven. And I said, what, what is it? How, how do you get there? Right? How do you, how do you get there? If you read Acts 15, it's about the council in Jerusalem, not too many years after the church had been founded. One of the big questions that they were arguing about was how do you get there, right? And so we started talking about heaven. And he said, "Well, you got to believe that Je you got to believe in Jesus." And I said, "Yeah, yeah." I said, "Do you do you? What, is that is your faith in Jesus?" Yeah. Well, unpack that. Who who is Jesus? Who's Jesus to you? He's the son of God. That's what he said. He's the son of God. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? And he's looking at me like, you're the pastor. What do you mean, what does that mean? And then it occurred to me. Ah, uh, I, I, I think I get it. Jesus didn't just say he was the son of God. He said he was God. And the Son of God is not a title that depicts a relationship with a deity and now he's the son of a deity, but it's a title that represents relationship that's different than a father and son here. The father and son in the earthly sense is just a picture of the relationship between the Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. And I said, you know, I, I, I think the same thing. I think that Jesus is the Son of God, but let, let me just test this out with you, Levi. I think that Jesus is God. And he goes, no. No, he's the Son of God. And I said, so... So you, you, you're making a distinction there. He's, well, he's a God, but he's not God the Father. And this, this is where I realized, okay, now how do, uh, how do I go into talking about the Trinity, the Father? And you heard me pray just a few moments ago. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we worship you as the one true God. This concept of Trinity is, is in the scriptures and it's, it's essential. It's essential, it's foundational in our understanding of who the Lord is. And I thought, Lord, I, I, I just, I can't, I don't have enough time with Levi to unpack all of this. So I, this is eventually where I left it. Levi, you said you wanted to talk about God. And he, we got to a place where he kind of calmed down, right? And was interacting with me. And I said to him, 
if I could tell you the most important thing about the Christian faith, it would be don't lose sight of who Jesus said that he was. There's a lot of things that are said about Jesus in our day and back in his day. You'll remember a week or two ago, we read where Jesus asked his followers, who do people say I am? Well, they were talking about it back then too. Who do people say that I am? And Peter and, and the disciples said, well, some think you're Elijah the prophet or John the Baptist, men that had been dead for some time. So there are people in our day that are also wondering, who, who is he? And Jesus, I think, is still asking this question, who do you say that I am? All right. And so I left with Levi, listen, uh, this is the best thing I guess I could tell you today. Don't lose sight of who Jesus said that he was. Because... The pathway to heaven is Jesus Christ. That's it. So that is a backdrop. I want to read a scripture from the Old Testament and then read some things that Jesus said about himself. This first scripture, I'll give you, I don't know, hundreds of years of uh, history in about 90 seconds. Heard of a guy named Moses, right? Led, led the children of Israel out of slavery, the exodus out of Egypt, slavery in Egypt to the promised land or right to the front door of the promised land. Moses was raised in the courts of Pharaoh, the Egyptian king. But he knew that his heritage was he, as a Hebrew, a Jew. And as he grew older, he began to feel the tension between what he'd been raised in and what his heritage was. But he'd never had an encounter with God. Then Moses got into some trouble, big trouble. He killed a man, not in self-defense. Now Moses is a murderer, and he runs for his life, and he escapes the long arm of Pharaoh. And he ends up meeting a man who's got a daughter that he takes as his wife. And he begins working for his father-in-law as a shepherd. And years after he's fled, the, after he's committed a murder and fled, like 40 years later, he finally has an encounter with God to go along with his sense of ambiguous sense of his heritage. Okay? This is one of the, my very favorite scriptures because it's a snapshot of an encounter with God and God is still having encounter with people in our day. Now it's not exactly like this. It's unique to each individual. But this is Moses' encounter with God when he was 80 years old. It reads like this out of the book of Exodus, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from in the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't this bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses replied, here I am. I like how it's, that's translated in another translation. It says, when God saw that he had captured Moses' attention, 
Then he called to him. Did you know God is still working and interested in capturing people's attention? My attention was significant, significantly captured when I was a junior in high school. Sitting in the Great Falls Evangelical Church under the preaching of Raleigh Strutz and Ingolf Kronstadt. There's a couple of good Nordic names for you. Raleigh Strutz and Ingolf Kronstad were teaching the Bible in this little church in Great Falls, Montana. And I didn't hardly even know it, but God was trying to get my attention as a 16-year-old. So God's got his attention. He speaks to him. And Moses, does this not seem a little weird? There's a voice coming out of a bush on fire that's not burning up. You're either going to just click in right away. This is different and this is spiritual and that's something I'm not. Or you're going to go, oh, okay, am I dreaming? You know, pinch myself. The bush is on fire, not burning up, and the bush is talking to me. Moses, Moses, here I am, he replied. Verse 5, do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of the harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. Then he says in verse 9, Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh, you must lead my people out of Egypt. Let's just pause for a moment. Forty years earlier, he had fled from Pharaoh because he'd murdered a man. So he was, there was a warrant out for his arrest in Egypt. But it's a different Pharaoh now. He argues with the Lord and the Lord said, I, I'm, I'm sending you. Verse 13, but Moses protested. You could, it could read, but Moses protested again. Larry and Stacy, did you protest when you heard you were being sent to the Upper Peninsula? You know, they can see Canada from their house. <laughs> but Moses protested, verse 13, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then who should I tell them? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. It's an interesting name. You ever run across anybody named I am Jones? I am Smith? I am. The, the, the Israelites held this name so sacred and to still do, or at least some, so sacred that they couldn't even spell out the full word that it meant, which it was spelled out as Yahweh. Yahweh. Like here, Moses, I'm sending you. No way. Yahweh. Right? I am who I am. Tell them I am is sending you. Okay, you remember what I talked about with Levi? Who, who is Jesus? How, it, well, he's God's son. Is he God? No, he's God's son. I think I'd encourage you to keep investigating that. 
So I want us to just for a few moments, there's seven times in the Gospel of John where Jesus makes very famous I am statements. Listen to these statements that Jesus made. They're all from the Gospel of John. He said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We sang about that today. I am the bread of life. John 8, 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. John, set, John 10, 7 through 9. So he explained to them, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the gate. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he pr prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by my message I have, that I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. When Jesus was saying these statements, I am the light of the world. I'm the gate. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the vine. He's going back to when God initially introduced himself to Moses. Well, who should I say has sent me to lead you out of slavery? Tell them I am who I am has sent me. Tell them I am has sent you. So when Jesus is making these statements, make no doubt the ones in his world that would have known the scriptures the very best the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they would have known because they had a very sensitive meter on 
uh, heresy. If somebody claimed to be God, that was as bad as it could get. And they accused Jesus of being, you're saying that you are God. They at least got that part right. Yes. But then they would follow, but you're not. You're not God. Wrong. The ones who would have known the very best who Jesus was claiming to be got the first part right. You're claiming to be God. These I am statements, that's blasphemy. Why? Because you're not God. And Jesus would say, try again. This is the only way. When Diane and I were just married in 1984, I was seven at the time, um, so. When we got married, my brother Scott got engaged shortly after, and then he got married later in 1984. So we flew from Portland to Chicago. I remember, I don't know why, but I remember we went through Salt Lake City to Chicago. And on the plane to Chicago, the longer portion of the flight, I sat next to a man who was a Muslim. And I don't know how we got into a conversation about God, but we did. And it wasn't contentious. It was enjoyable. It was collaborative. And I asked him many questions about his Islamic faith. And, and he, in turn, asked me many questions about my faith in Jesus. And I asked him, who is Jesus to you? Oh, Jesus is a prophet. He was a good man, a good teacher. And I, I was like, I, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. And he said, well, why not? And I said, well, if somebody's going to be called a good teacher or a prophet, you couldn't be a liar, right? And still have the, you could be a teacher and a prophet, just not a good one. And he said, oh, no, no, Jesus didn't lie. He didn't say that he was God. And I thought, oh, that, that lines up with what some other people thought back at Jesus' time, and it lines up with what some people think nowadays. So it was a very pleasant conversation. When we got done, he said to me, now in Islam, we have this thing that the holder of truth is obligated to share that truth with one who does not have it. So now I have done so. I've fulfilled my obligation. And I said, yeah, we have, we have something similar in Christianity. So likewise. And, and then I, I was able to say to him, I, I wish I could remember his name. I can't. But I said, you've been very kind to me in tone and, and just in this conversation. Thank you. And I know that you would want me to embrace what you believe. And if I'm being honest, I would want the same thing from you. But I know that God is able to speak to us in ways that we can understand him. And I, I would like to part with this. Would it be okay with you if I prayed for you and would you be willing to pray for me that we would both pray, God, would you speak and make yourself known to each of us? And he said, yes. It was really, a, it was an encouraging conversation. I want to close this and then we're going to share communion together. I want to close with something from a man named C.S. Lewis, very famous author, pastor, teacher, uh, theologian, philosopher. C.S. Lewis wrote this, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. 
he would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You cannot shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. Excuse me. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So if you were to review the seven I am statements that John captures in his gospel, you, you probably will come to the same conclusion that C.S. Lewis did, that Jesus didn't leave us any wiggle room about who he is. How can you say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me? unless you're either a liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? And I want to ask you this morning, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that Jesus is? You might still be in your investigative mode, and you're not sure. And that that goes for those of you that are online. That's okay. The Lord is waiting to capture our attention, just like he was with Moses. But maybe you're at a place where you could say, I know who I think he is. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and I'm going to invite you. I'm just going to ask you if you would just bow your heads. This prayer is for those who are ready to, as C.S. Lewis would say, fall down at his feet and call him Lord. I don't don't want you to feel obligated to pray with me. But I certainly would like that if you could pray with me sincerely. God, I know that you're with us. Jesus, I know that you're Lord. And we take a moment just to pray. And as as our brother in Christ, C.S. Lewis, said many years ago, we just take this moment to prayerfully fall at your feet and call you Lord. And we take a moment to renew, or maybe for the first time, surrender to you by faith. And just say, I believe who you said you were. And I trust my life and my eternity into your hands. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak through the Holy Spirit to my friends in ways that they can understand you. Would you make yourself known and give us courage to follow you in faith obedience? And I ask for this in your great name, in faith in you giving thanks to the Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. And that right there is what qualifies anybody to come to this table. You don't have to be a member of any particular church. But the communion dinner, as it were, this this sacrament of communion, is for those that would say, I believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And I accept him for that. And so if that's you this morning, I want to invite you in just a moment. We're going to stand up in just a moment and invite you to these tables. And and, um, I think Myron will, if you have a hard time moving in crowds, he'll find you. He'll bring the communion uh, bread and juice to you. But this is a time of remembering, affirming, yes, You are Lord. Thank you for what you've done to accept me. Thank you for 
giving your life for me. Because the juice represents his shed blood and the bread represents his body broken for us. Somebody who stood in our place to take on the consequence of sin that we would never be able to bear and live afterwards. That's what this is. It's a time of remembrance of the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to ask Dave and Debbie, would you come forward? Diane and Myron, come on forward and we'll get in place to serve you. And uh, I'm going to ask if you would, um, if you could just come down the middle aisles if you're there and circle back to your seats that way. And if you're on the outside, just come from around. And I think we'll not have a log jam, uh, but I'm just going to take a, word, a moment to pray and then invite you forward. Lord, we thank you for, gosh, going to the cross for us. You know we could have never bared that and come out alive. And you gave your shed blood and broken body, and we, we thank you and we celebrate that you have been resurrected. You are the resurrection and you are the life. And Lord, we take this communion in remembrance of you. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and come and receive communion as you're prepared to do. God bless you as you do. If you have not yet taken your communion, and I invite you to do so, knowing that the Lord Jesus loves you. God bless you. We're going to close our time together with a song that is uh, part of what Jesus, one of the I am statements that the Lord made. And so I invite you to take whatever posture of worship you would like as we worship and close. Please feel free to stand or to sit as you wish. There's a whisper I can hear it when I'm quiet. Abide in me. Abide in me. When I feel my troubles, my troubles multiply. Abide in me, abide in me, oh, I'll rest in you, Lord, to hear your voice changes everything.
thoughts fill my words and my actions abide in me abide in me to know you well would be I want to uh, give you a heads up for this coming week. Look and see if you might find an evidence of God trying to capture your attention. If you see a burning bush that's talking to you, give me a call. I'd like to see that too. But I want to encourage you. Keep your eyes open for any indication, any sign that God is trying to get your attention. And then I want to encourage you, listen to that. I want to encourage you to take time to read a small portion of scripture this week. You don't have to read the whole Bible, just a small portion and listen for what the Lord is saying and see if he doesn't strengthen you and encourage you through the scriptures. Amen? Now the Lord bless you. And the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and give to you his peace, his shalom peace, because he loves you. Oh, the Lord loves you. You are the apple of his eye. Go into a new week looking for him. You're dismissed, friends. God bless you.